together for today's meeting, which will be on um, Ocean Protocol. And it'll be our first go around at like really trying to spend about 45 minutes to an hour on, um, on one protocol and seeing how it goes. Um, we've clicked record for today, which I think is good. Um, but one thing we want to say at the beginning of the recording is, of course, this is mostly an hour of learning and exploration. And we want you to feel comfortable asking any types of questions. No one will be held accountable. Um, and there is definitely no investment advice going around in this hour of learning in kernel. And I hope that everyone feels free to just explore and ask any of the questions that might be guided through um, the Figma board and through the conversation. So um, with that, I might pass it over to Michael just to like kick off some of the framing. We have a few people that have made their way already to the Figma board. We would love for many to make their way there for us to um, collectively sense make about Ocean Protocol and by extension, um, think about token ecosystems in general. Good morning. Good evening, folks. This is uh, the we had a great tokenomic study group a couple of weeks ago where which was more of a sort of a kickoff to the block and talking about people's intentions and interests and questions and a little bit of playing around with one uh, particular protocol. But this is the first session where we're just going to focus on one protocol or token and see what we can teach each other about it. Um, with that in mind, this is really meant to be as participatory as possible, um, especially if you've had a chance to dig into the to some of the to protocol docs or if you have any familiarity with the protocol ahead of time, you know, we'd love to hear your questions and your ideas uh, and for, each, for us to discuss that with each other. We are lucky that we have someone at, who was, I think, a core developer of Ocean Protocol for a time. So is, um, uh, David, who I'm going to hand this to in just a second. Um, this is, as I'm sure it would be you know, worth hours of our time to have a fireside chat just with David and hear him explain everything to us. But um, I think we, I'm going to let him kind of open things up and maybe talk a little bit about his background with this. But this is, um, this is not meant to be David teaching us about Ocean Protocol. It's hopefully what we're supposed to be teaching each other. And we're looking forward to David you know, being here to maybe clarify some, some things, answer some questions, maybe steer us towards the most interesting and uh, and valuable and edifying and generalizable parts of um, of of this particularly interesting and and prominent protocol. With the, the spirit being that we'd love to learn about ocean, but we also want to learn things that that we could take to our own protocols or to our own you know lives in in Web three. That and you know what can we learn from ocean, both good and bad, that would um, that will make us uh, better practitioners and participants in, in Web3. So um, welcome to Tokenomic Study Group. And um, David, would you like to introduce yourself? And um, and also, I don't know if Renee is here. I think Renee actually nominated the, the um, uh, ocean for, uh, for, for this. So um, if Renee, you're here and you want to jump in after David, just to say why you're, um, uh, or actually, before, is Renee on the, on the call? She's not here right now. She's not. Okay. I think it's like very, very early in the morning and where she lives. So. Um, why don't, um, David, do you want to tell us a little bit about Ocean and your experience with it? And then we can kind of walk through some parts of the Figma to illuminate different aspects of the, um, of the protocol. Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Can everybody hear me all right? We can. All right, cool, cool, cool. Uh, so hi, I'm David. Uh, online, I also go by Mantis Clone. Um, I used to be a core developer at the Ocean Protocol Foundation. And, uh, I'd love to dive into some of the, the tokenomics aspects of, of how their protocol works. Basically, Ocean Protocol is building this, this um, their, their, their customer facing product is like a, a, a data marketplace, but they, they, they've created this protocol that, that allows for the exchange of data sets, off, off chain data sets that um, are all the payments and, and um, um, tokenization of the data sets happens on chain. Um, and they, they've done this with uh, uh, a few different services that, that um, uh, verify payments and um, track um, transfer events of, of all these different data tokens. And then they have this, this front end GUI where you can look at various statistics about the data set, how many times it's been consumed, how many times it's been um, uh, viewed and, and uh, other, other stuff like that. And then they've got also kind of a whole ecosystem built around this where they, they're trying to build out new 
features on top of the protocol, build out new products that are built using the protocol and trying to um, drive both the supply side and the, the consume side of the market, um, all incentivized using their, their Ocean token. Um, so I, I think a great place to start actually is like this uh, this diagram that we see here on the, um, oh, <laughs> I realize I'm, I'm on Zoom, so I can't move around here. I'm gonna-, I'm gonna You can actually, um, I'm following you, David. So as you move around the Figma board, okay, we, we will follow your lead on the Zoom. Okay, here, I'm, I'm on the, I'm on it now. So here, I'm, I'm looking at- Sorry, the, Vivek, will you record? It is recording. Thank you. I see now that it's following me, okay. So yeah, so the first thing that I, I'd like to highlight is uh, over here in this tokenomics diagram section. Um, this is the Web3 sustainability loop that um, the Ocean Protocol founders and um, bot leaders really kind of use as a guiding star whenever they're trying to make decisions about their tokenomics. Um, the, the, the idea is that they, they started off with this, this token sale back in 2017, as well as a... Um, an emissions schedule that um, you know that there, there's a there's a hard cap on ocean tokens of something like 1.4 billion, and um, they have these kind of different buckets. They've got the the uh, the foundation treasury that's used for for funding um, development. They've got their um, uh, I think they've got like an, a community treasury that gets funded through. Um, uh, protocol revenue and then is used to, to feed back into uh, future developments. Um, and so what they do is they they try to have people um, build stuff or do actions that 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 benefit the network. So if you're uh, creating data sets or if you're hosting a marketplace or if you're providing compute resources or if you're providing um, data storage resources, um, all of those different actions are incentivized um, in the network uh, uh, via fees. So like anytime somebody interacts with the protocol, a small fee is taken and then fed back to the, the, um, the appropriate recipients. Cool. Maybe David, this is beautiful. And this image gives us a place to kind of like hold on to. Maybe we start to meander into some questions and and okay, yeah. Uh, Taya, I know you you had your hand raised. Um, we could start there, and maybe I could help if 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 needed as well. But Taya, please. Awesome. Hey, thanks, David. Um, uh, appreciate you being one of the uh, the developers on this and uh, pushing uh, Web three forward. So first of all, I appreciate you uh, for all your work there. Uh, um, number, uh, my question was simply when you first launched the protocol and, and I obviously don't know how long you were, you were at the team. Um, but just for understanding the history was the tokenomics, was the protocol built around the tokenomics or had you thought about the protocol first and then figured out where best the tokenomics had fit? Um, I, I guess like for me, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about the process in how you thought about incorporating the tokenomics and then when and I, yeah i guess when and, and how early that is a great question and the honest answer is i don't know i don't know if the token came first or if the tokenomics came first um i think if i had to guess i'd say probably the token came first um they they, they did an ico back in 2017 i think um so I, I think a lot of their their tokenomics blog posts came out around 2019. Um, so I'm guessing just based on that timeline that they they kind of they started with funding um, via an ICO and then they were able to to develop the tokenomics structure around that once they had the funding. Um, I don't know if that's feasible in today's market. I think that the 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 days of ICOs are kind of maybe yeah. past a little bit. <laughs> I think they're also quite, um, they're very frowned upon by the SEC as well. Um, so uh, avoid if you can, ideally. Right. Um, uh, but yeah, I, so so uh, I used to actually work at a data marketplace, um, but it was a little different. It was more like a streaming data marketplace. 
Um, and I think this is more like sort of like almost like Amazon type where it's like, hey, you can like buy data off off the protocol. Um, so I actually like studied Ocean Protocol quite a bit when I was first thinking about that original idea that I was working on. Um, so uh, I, I was it's uh, I was just curious to get your opinion sort of being on the insider because I feel like I've read enough from the outside. Sure. So so my inside read on that was uh, that the ability to download a data set is kind of the the simplest use case. And it's also the one that that um, exposes the data to the maximum amount of counterparty risk. You know, the mm. idea that all of your customers are able to directly download your data set implies that you're creating a trust relationship there, that, that your customers aren't going to just turn around and open source the data as soon as they have it in their custody, right? Um, and the only recourse that you would have at that point would be using the traditional legal system to like say, hey, you shouldn't have done that and go after them in the, in the courts or something like that. Um, but we're trying to build like a, a decentralized uh, version that maybe doesn't rely on the traditional uh, legal system to enforce rule breaking or, or um, trust breaking. Uh, so what, what Ocean developed is this idea of, of compute to data, which kind of flips the, flips the equation on its head where the, the data provider um, provides the data, hosts the data somewhere on their, on their off-chain servers, um, but also provides a compute environment along with it so that the data consumer can Presumably, they 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 want the data for some sort of calculation or some sort of reason that they, that they could um, distill down into an algorithm. So then they send that algorithm to the data provider, who then runs the the algorithm and sends the result back to the consumer, so that the data set itself is never um, uh, it, 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 the, the privacy of the data set is maintained. Okay. David, jump in uh, with a very con sorry, Andy. I just this might help me as I'm kind of new new to this. It might help others uh, before we get into the kind of the bigger ideas. Could David or anybody else who's studied the protocol is could we get one specific example of how the Ocean Protocol is already being applied? I know that it's a. I actually looked around quickly and I didn't. I'm sure it's out there. I, some protocols haven't yet found sort of their their application yet. I think Ocean Protocol has been around long enough and is well established. Enough. I'm sure. I'm sure people are using it. If we just had one sort of thing, like someone put this data up there and then someone you know paid for it for X, I think that would help make it all all the sort of the tokenomics and the theory and 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 sort of the the vision around it more concrete for me. I think I have I have an idea of 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 one of one vertical that I think is using it. Um, uh, I'll start by saying that that the honest truth is I, I think that they are still trying to um, build up that sort of the the traction of of, of actual usage. Uh, I think a lot of the usage so far has been incentivized or or kind of toy toy usage, where where nobody's really using it for a, a real business case yet. Um, but there, there, there are plenty of ideas out there. Like, um, I think one of them was um, uh, agricultural data. Some, somebody is trying to, uh, I think there was even a tweet about it recently. Uh, uh, there is a, a group that's incentivizing a contest using ocean protocol so that, um, that they're inviting data scientists to ideate and then publish useful data sets and algorithms for the purpose of, of agricultural something or other. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm gonna see if I can try and find the actual tweet because I think that'd be interesting. R Richard Blackman, do you have, uh, you guys use it at Algovira, don't you? Hey, yeah, um, I'm not sure. Let me know if my sound isn't working. I'm, my video might be jumping, um, but yeah, we use it for selling AI models. So, um, yeah, you, you can use it for a data marketplace or like a, a model marketplace or even like an app marketplace. So we're hoping to make apps available through Ocean Protocol. Um, we even sometimes publish like, uh, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, but they're like interactive code environments. So they're kind of like interactive papers almost. And so you can publish a, an NFT for a, a Jupyter Notebook 
and then you can you can make that available on the marketplace based on who has a token, uh, for example. Um, so yeah, we're using it as an AI marketplace uh, technology. And Jess yes. is putting some really great stuff in the chat if you're looking for uh, further references to some work growing communities in Asia or Parkinson's in Singapore. Uh, so it's also that's... being used in the automotive. There's a, a fork of the ocean marketplace that's being used by, for example, Mercedes, and they're using it to share, uh, I guess, data about manufacturing. Um, but people are also talking about using it marketplaces for self-driving cars, because a lot of companies are quite far behind companies like Tesla. And by pooling their data, maybe they can you know, catch up on some of these uh, leading self-driving uh, manufacturers. Yeah. Richard, could you talk about like if anything that you've posted has earned Ocean Token and how that comes to you, if so? Um, so the short answer is no. Um, C2D has some issues. It's not uh, that mature. Um, they just launched V4 um, recently and it kind of broke everything. So um, we, I don't know if I've, I don't think we've ever sold anything on Ocean. I know some people have. Um, we're planning to try again soon by launching some of these new AI models that people might have seen, like stable diffusion. So we're hoping to have that and sell it through Ocean in pro probably this month. But uh, no, we've never sold anything. OK, OK, good to know. <laughs> Related to that, David, one of the things I'd also love to uh, learn more about is like the initial emission uh, logic, right? So you say that like Ocean is created in sort of 2017 and there is this like emission over time that sits at the beginning of this Web3 sustainability loop. And like these, these kind of emission schedules in general are really interesting to think about because they imply a lot of different like economic theory, you know, like, uh, like Bitcoin has an emission schedule in some sense of, of the word, right? Like associated with the number of Bitcoin per block that are like created as rewards and that being halved over time until it gets to the limits of 21 million. And that implies a certain deflationary uh, approach to money it implies like certain hard currency ideas, the Austrian school of economics, all of that kind of stuff is implied just by the emission schedule. And I wonder like what oceans is, if it stayed the same and if there's any like sort of ideas around why it is the way that it is that might be worth discussing. I'm, I'm, uh, frantically trying to find the blog post that has that information. I I think that their emotions uh, em, em, emission schedule stayed the same throughout. Um, it changes based on uh, where the tokens are sent as well. I guess I know, I know the most recent thing is like data farming, which a lot of the emitted tokens are getting used for now. They used to be for ocean dev grants. So they, they do some experimentation with what the tokens are used for, at least. And, and who controls that? Is it the foundation? Uh, do they have kind of admin access on the contracts? Uh, do you have a... I think so, yeah. I think the foundation has the bucket that was allocated to them during the initial, initial token uh, tokenomics release and I, I think the the foundation receives a bucket every every so often um, and then once once it's in their custody then they can do what they want with it so I believe that the, the foundation is using ocean tokens to um, fund the the initiatives that that uh, Richard just mentioned like the the data farming and um, uh, they've also switched to a VE tokenomics model for for um, for incentivizing different data sets so there have been a lot of changes to their to their kind of tokenomics design recently. Interesting. And and can you just for specifically tell us what a VE token? Oh, oh sure. Yeah. So v, VE is a vote escrow. It's the idea that you lock up ocean tokens for a certain set amount of time, and then based on that, you receive the ability to. Uh, um, 
to, to direct data farming emissions to data sets. Um, so, so the idea there is that um, using your, your vote escrowed tokens, you can effectively vote on which data set you think is valuable. Um, and then you get rewarded when that valuable data set is consumed. So as a curator of data sets, you receive, uh, you receive tokens for curating. Um, obviously the, the producer of that data set will also receive tokens for, for producing the data set. The marketplace that's hosting the, the sale, the, that facilitates the sale is also gonna receive a small cut. Um, and I think there's, there's other fees in there also, like the, a fee could go to the, um, Oh shoot! Uh, there's it, it used to be liquidity provider fees, but they they've kind of removed that concept because um, they they had an exploit with the pools, the ocean token pools. So they've they've kind of discontinued support for them. And it's, <laughs> the, v, the VE token model. This is like from it's the same thing used by Curve. Is is it inspired by watching like Curve and the Curve Wars and just thinking about like data as a kind of liquidity? Is that uh, yes, I, I okay. that that is that is indeed correct. Um, they they saw that Curve was using the VE token model to direct token emissions to uh, their various different liquidity pools. Um, so they're kind of using the same concept, and this in this way, it's it's instead curating data sets. The idea being that if you if you vote on a data set that ends up proving to be downloaded frequently, then you receive rewards for having having curated correctly. This kind of uh, sums up what, uh, what what Ocean focuses on, I think, which is um, the first one is IP management through NFTs for data, and then also DeFi on top of those NFTs. That's kind of Ocean's core focus, as well as maybe the, the funding through tokenomics. Um, and so like in terms of what is centralized in Ocean, um, it, it, some things are centralized and some are decentralized. And especially AI, um, it requires a lot of different components. So for example, you need funding for an AI ecosystem. You need some sort of IP management uh, and finance around that IP management. You also need storage. You also need compute. Um, and so there's many different components that need to come together. And what I think Ocean did that was smart was um, they focused on one component in the AI stack um, and tried to decentralize that and then use centralized components for other things. Like for example, the compute is centralized. Um, up until very recently, the storage was centralized, like people were using Google Drive. And so um, it's really a big challenge to you know, decentralize the entire AI stack and Ocean are focusing on their own niche and implemented the rest quite centralized components like using AWS compute. And then hopefully over time, the whole stack will be decentralized. So it's still super early. And we're seeing exactly that. Uh, Ocean is trying to integrate with a decentralized storage solutions like Arweave, Filecoin, um, data streams like uh, um, Chainlink and uh, uh, the graph. Um, looking at even like personal data streams from Ceramic, uh, I, I think are all on their roadmap. And then there's there's like all the different um, decentralized compute providers out there. I think uh, Filecoin is trying to come out with this back Bacalhau, um project, um, and then I, I think Algovera was looking at other sorts of of compute environments as well. I, I wonder we can continue on that thread. Um, I wonder if anyone. Maybe maybe Andy, but, but but I'd love to hear from anyone else who's been involved with with VE tokens. This like general mechanic that seems to be be happening across the token ecosystem. Um, the simple overview. Thank you, David, for giving us an entry point to it. Is that how it works? Um, both the curve balancer and, and now it looks like even in VE Ocean is that you have to lock the project ocean token. In this case, Ocean in turn for VE project token. Um, an example here of the mechanics simply is you can lock their, your ocean for up to four years, you get this token, you get 
your ocean back at the end, plus any rewards along the way. Um, some critical rules to this fictional game with these tokens is that you cannot unlock before the preset time. You can extend your lock time or the lock amount, but lock time cannot be decreased. It is also non-transferable. Um, so just like I'm trying to like wrap my head around the like implications of this type of a game um, generally, but also in the context of Ocean is, is helpful. Um, I would, would love to hear your thoughts too. Awesome. So there's another example of um, VE tokens. Um, there's a network state uh, attempt company or project called Nation3. So the, the URL is nation3.org. Um, uh, nation, yeah. Um, and then the other one you can go ahead, go ahead and just go to the nation, the, yeah, the nation tab. And so their concept is, can we raise enough money to start a network state? Um, and you need to have two VE nation. VE nation is you need two nation tokens. You lock them up for a specific amount of time. Once you've locked that up, you can, um, you can get a Genesis passport and there will only ever be 420 Genesis passports, which is like your citizenship for the network state. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, similar to Curve, if you are to be, if you're a liquidity provider for nation to ETH on Uniswap, you also get a 2.5 X LP return um, if, you have locked VE Nation. So it kind of sets us two purposes. One, the you buy the Nation token, which is, um, which causes the price of that token to go up, um, ETH liquidity rewards. Um, and that is kind of the mechanism that they're using to bootstrap um, their network state. And I, I thought that was pretty interesting. So I, I, I am like a very small holder. I don't have two nation tokens. I need to get my uh, passport at some point, I guess. Um, but what's interesting and what I like about them, uh, if you scroll up the Vic, um, is that they actually have a lot of bounties for you to earn it. So you don't actually even have to buy the token. So if you just go to their like website, um, just like the, yeah. Yeah, that should, that should work. And you scroll down. Um, what I liked about it was keep going somewhere. They have a, a bounties program. I don't know where it is on their website. Um, uh, but I thought that was really cool. It's like, you don't have to pay for the token. You can also do bounties. And I've done some of those. Oh, right there. Open tasks on Dwork. Um, so they make it, it's an interesting way to earn tokens as well as you can just pay into it. Um, so uh, that's like another example I've seen of, uh, uh, VE tokens being used for for an interesting purpose to, to for a very different type of use case, which is bootstrapping a network state. Thank you. Yeah, this is a great example of the the ways in which yeah it definitely broadens it for me. Hmm. Interesting. It depends how you feel about states uh, and whether one is. Uh, a fan of the Lagrange star or uh, perhaps different mechanisms of organization. I think like one of the other interesting things to say about like this is that the notion of like using tokens for voting has been around since Ethereum has, and in fact, prior to it. Uh, so like color coins and these kinds of things, even on Bitcoin, were like ways of uh, using digital tokens as means of expressing opinion outside of pure like economic or monetary value uh and back in the history of like like ethereum once it got going was like people recognized very early on that like the notion that one would have to lock tokens to vote was problematic because it's deeply like capital inefficient and the first solution that was ever like proposed to that was something called the mini me standard which was like a governance like an erc20 token extended by jordi bailina which said okay you can uh, have a token which is ERC20 compliant and that allows you to vote without having to lock it. Uh, and then 
like Curve stumbled upon this mechanism. Lots of other stuff happened in between, uh, like, and then Curve stumbled upon this mechanism. And the Curve Wars illustrated something interesting about vote escrow tokens that allow for the bootstrapping of certain kinds of liquidity. Like whether it's a positive or a negative thing, I think still kind of remains to be seen, right? Uh, and I like I would I would call it like highly experimental. Uh, and I think that we're kind of watching the social effects that this stuff has. It's like an important thing to recognize that when you take any token and you make it uh, you give it the possibility of expressing something outside of the like economic or financial, you enter the realm of socio technology, right? And like whether these things truly um serve the full and true expression of people's opinions um i think rem it remains to be seen it's really interesting that ocean is using it uh and i think it's interesting it's too uh, that, i think there, there's something i definitely want to talk about real quickly i i just i i, I have to head out in about 10 minutes but um they, with with ve tokens inevitably somebody creates the liquid uh, uh staking uh, mechanic built on top of it so we we've seen that with curve i think um the, there's there's a bunch of different places that are building um liquidity lockers for for um vote escrow tokens there uh, we saw it uh, with balancer uh a balancer there, there's aura built on top of balancer that's creating this idea where if you if you give your tokens to them, stake your tokens with them and let them lock it on your behalf, you then get a cut of the rewards, plus you get Aura tokens to be part of the Aura community. And then Aura becomes like a majority voter in, in the wars of, of Balancer, like the Balancer Wars or the Curve Wars or whatever. Um, so something like that has, has happened with Ocean as well and with this, this protocol called H2O. Um, H2O, or rather, H2O is its own separate thing, it, but but the same people who created H2O are also creating the liquid uh, um, staking wrapper around VE Ocean called, uh, I think they're calling it Poseidon Ocean or something like that. Uh, so I, the, the H2O I mentioned, uh, H2O is another thing that's built on top of Ocean. Um, it's, a, it's a stable coin. So the idea is that you um, uh, put H, uh, you put Ocean into a maker style vault um, and then it mints H2O and H2O is modeled after Rye, which is another stable coin that's not pegged and it's it's algorithmically, uh, 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 what's the word, debounced. It's like, uh, it's, it's uh... so there's like all these other tokenomics things that are being built on top of Ocean's tokenomics right now. I think that's what I'm trying to say. This is really cool. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, again, really cool is an interesting epithet to apply to it. Uh, and <laughs> I think that, uh, I, I know Ryan has his hand up, so let's go to him maybe. Yeah, I, that's a good point, Andy. I think when, when we are looking at tokenomics, whether it's a decision to invest in something or a decision to build on something, the challenge for me is looking at it as a game and being like, oh, that's really cool. But the thing to understand is when you're looking at a platform, especially these the token locking platforms, we as investors and as builders have to understand that those platform treasuries that we're locking to are also taking their treasuries and loaning it out to other things, and which is loaning it out to another thing. And this is how like banking works, right? But the second that one platform ecosystem or uh, protocol becomes over leveraged, then the whole the whole castle comes cr crawling, you know, crumbling down. We've definitely seen that in the past year. Um, I wanted to share, and this one's on that line of like really cool. It's it was um, uh, very interesting when it happened, but as far as an experiment and not necessarily something that's proven to be valuable, but um, building on this VE token example, um, Andre Crohe, who is like the inventor of, of Yearn, um, and is always kind of pushing the boundaries. Um, 
and who as an experimenter always puts it out there that he creates as experiments and not as like, um, you know, uh, things that are going to work, but this, this, what he kind of built on this idea with V token, um, is he created, uh, this idea with basically it's like, what, and this is in phantom, whatever top, I think it was 30 protocols that had the uh, most total value locked in their protocols we would then be distributed an NFT. And, um, within this VE token mechanics, the emissions would get sent out to these uh, NFTs and those NFTs that indefinitely would just get emissions from this um, exchange uh, would get sent to these NFTs, but the NFTs as a whole, whoever owned them, whether it was a person or another protocol or whatever, um, they can trade those over time. So those NFTs become like kind of liquid treasuries that can be their own asset over time. I thought that's very interesting to look at um, locking something, but at the same time, the end point that the value goes to is in, an, is in itself an NFT and can be traded. Um, so yeah, something to, to, to look at. But to, another thing to jump off with Andy's point, it's like when this happened, it basically crashed phantom because within like I was in things where it's a group of people a couple hundred people in a discord channel and then within eight hours there's like close to four billion dollars total value locked and then that thing gets kind of rugged pulled by or or uh, yeah it's, it's crazy so it, the line between providing value and an experiment and then the game kind of going horridly wrong is is something to look at with especially with these uh token locking mechanisms just wanted to share that i'll i'll uh, put something in the chat with the uh, andre mechanic if anybody's looking interested mm. in looking into it yeah please do that's a, a very useful one the power of incentive mechanisms is uh, always good to keep front and center in these discussions david um daryl has asked a really good question which might also like uh be a good use of the last few minutes unless you have to leave right now in which case please do but he says uh, i'm curious to see the mechanics of actually using the ve ocean tokens is that via snapshot vote allocation towards particular data sets like, like how do you actually use these tokens uh can you show us uh, uh, where we would go i th i think that that information could be found in the uh the ve ocean launch blog post i think it's in the top in the middle there um and admittedly, I think it came out like maybe a week or two ago. So admittedly, I haven't looked too closely into it. I wish I had a bunch of ocean tokens laying around that I could stake and then <laughs> use, but I do not. Um, I, uh, I think they have a smart contract where you can direct your, your VE ocean tokens. I think it's like the the it might be the data farming ones. Yeah, I'm trying to find like an interface where I could choose a data set to lock against. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. I and I I don't actually know if they have an interface built for that yet. I'm, I'm guessing that they probably do, but. Yeah, that's one of the things like notable, I suppose so far for me is like, where are these like valuable data sets, right? Like what, what is an example of one that maybe otherwise would not be incentivized um, that I could like click to um, trying to find them. Yeah. Well, the place to look for that is surely the marketplace, right? Uh, for the valuable data sets. That's uh, for. Right. But I guess these two things going together, right? Like the marketplace and then being able to decide to stake Ocean in exchange for VE Ocean, shouldn't those be in the same place?
Yes. I know, David, you have to go in a minute. I don't know if there's any final thoughts you'd have. Obviously, I, I find this I find this valuable. Um, I hope um, if you have any closing thoughts. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I'm super excited about Ocean. I think that uh, the it's it's a platform upon which a bunch of other stuff could be built. You could build like a social media platform on top of Ocean. You could build AI bots that live inside of cars and make transactions with each other based on data that they're constantly collecting. Um, and, and these these transactions could be minuscule. You could be just sending a single message as a data set. Um, um, I think I think there's applications for like um, uh, financial data if you have two big banks that have these massive databases and they want to be able to like derive insights based on um, aggregates of, of, of all of their financial data. Or, or maybe it would be a third party. It'd be like a government coming in and saying, we want to understand the, the internal financial data that you guys have better. Um, but the banks aren't necessarily willing to give up the data itself. Using the compute to data concept, you could have a large third party create this algorithm that that looks at the data and derives insights from it, but then lets the actual data itself stay stay private. I think there's there's huge um, applications there. Uh, I think in the medical field, uh, there's there's a whole bunch of use cases there where medical data could be uh, could stay private and only approved algorithms can run on it. Algorithms that have proven that have been proven to not leak personally identifiable information. Um, I think that that could unlock large swaths of of medical data that is not usable because the uh, the AI expertise doesn't reside in house at at the place where places where it's being collected. So, I, I think this I, I think Ocean has uh, an amazing ability to connect up all of these different data scientists and data collectors to build bigger and better AI models and other stuff too. <laughs> I, I think yeah we spent a lot of time talking about the the financing and in particular the curation mechanism on data sets which I don't know too much about I think it is useful to have a curation uh, on top of data sets but the thing that I'm most excited for with Ocean is um, the ability for people to to own the data uh, that it that that is used to to build these really powerful AI models so at the moment for example all of the value generated by AI uh, it just flows to a centralized tech company and the people who provided that data get none of the none of the rewards but if we can actually um, use tokens to represent ownership of the data that people contribute to these ai models we can have these much more complex value flows as ai is used if your data was used uh, in that ai you can have you know this um these rewards uh, constantly being uh, uh coming your way so um that's the thing that i'm most excited about is redistributing the value generated by ai I've got to jump off, but thank you everyone for, for having me. It was a great chat. Wonderful. Thank you, David. The, the interesting aspects of this for me is that um, the, the three major uses that, that David and Richard, you've just now mentioned are, are like genuinely fascinating and, and compelling in, in many ways, right? Like private medical data sets, really, really awesome stuff. The sharing of like, uh, self-driving cars and data that allows for like competitive advantage in some ways, but also just like much better models in an increasing fashion. And then like its general application in AI are all, as I say, like very compelling. They're also highly regulated <laughs> and there is all sorts of like socio-technological questions around these, right? Which is like, like Trent and the team at Ocean is just incredible. And they've been working on this stuff uh, you know, I mean, Trent was involved in Bitcoin early on. In fact, like him and Bruce prior to Ocean built something called a scribe, which is like one of the coolest things that I, and the first book I ever published, I published on a scribe <laughs> um, because they did this really amazing like media protocol based on Bitcoin that you could like, it was incredible. Uh, so they're, they're wonderful innovators and, uh, and really deep thinkers about the promises of this technology. It's just interesting to me to think about like, well, most of the uses of Ocean, while compelling, are like in these industries that are like incredibly regulated, that have that move very slowly, and that have entrenched incentives, uh, particularly like like health and and 
kind of to some degree already like automated cars uh, because the like the perceived danger of things going wrong there and the perceived danger of something going wrong with AI is enormous. And yet, like, of course, you know, Richard, I think we've had many discussions where like that perceived danger is greatly attenuated by decentralizing the data on which AI is trained and giving people the ability to control it. But like, have you thought much about like the socio-technological aspects of the stuff and how it applies to like wider regulatory concerns and the necessity of interfacing with people in positions of entrenched power in order to like convince them that this kind of thing is is indeed viable and in fact like economically optimal and risk mitigating like how do you, how do you think those discussions are kind of going yeah it's really interesting because um like i don't know if you follow ai twitter at all but there's a lot of talk about you know ai safety um ai ethics ai alignment a lot of these different things um and there's this kind of discussion going on about how heavily ai should be regulated some people think that you know this technology is too powerful to put in the hands of everyone which means that only the big tech companies should be allowed to have access to us you know of course the tech companies are going to say that only they should have access to us um I'm kind of more scared about centralized power and what uh, centralized authorities do with AI than what individuals do with AI. And so, um, you know, it, it's an ongoing discussion that I continue to think about, but um, I kind of see decentralization as a way to get around um, AI regulation that I think might come down the track. Um, I think, you know, if AI does become heavily regulated and that only centralized tech companies uh, can use this, um, I think that decentralization is a potential answer. Um, and of course, we have to do that in a safe way as well um, to try and limit like harmful applications of AI. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's one of my main motivating factors is to is that I see a lot of regulation uh, coming, which a lot of which um, I might not agree with, a lot of it that is created by tech companies. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like an option B in, in that sense, I would say. And of course, there's risks too, which were, you know, we we just submitted a paper to a machine learning conference on, you know, the, the potential benefits of decentralization as well as uh, the risks. And so we always have to think of those. I have, I have one more general question, less about uh, AI, more about the token model here, uh, just to kind of like perhaps uh, bring us home for the end of this call, which is. You know, Toby Shoren in uh, a fireside in this block men mentioned a very, very interesting notion well applied in mechanism design and token specifically, which is uh, a minimum forkable fee, <laughs> right? Like, like what is the, like the minimum, or the, right, it's really like, what is the maximum fee you can charge without making your protocol forkable? Uh, and this is part of the sustainability that we've talked a lot about, like, initial uh, distribution, emission schedule, the manner in which like VE and other grants uh, work in terms of keeping this Web3 sustainability loop that Ocean has put forward working. The other aspect of it is, is the fees charged. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if anybody, Richard or others, Teo maybe, uh, you have thoughts about like like what are the minimum fees that these kinds of protocols can charge while uh, remaining sort of compelling enough in their use cases that people end up using them and and paying the fee rather than forking the protocol and kind of getting their own thing going and and what contributes to that because the, you know like in the case of Ocean right like the more data that is there perhaps the uh, the the more worth it it is to pay a small fee uh, and the more difficult it is to fork the protocol as a whole uh, so this is like a very very interesting thing for me in terms of like protocol design and token economies in general is like what are the things which contribute to like a minimum forkable fee I think Ocean's fees, uh, just for context, I think they're about 0.5% uh, 
on a transaction. I think they're very reasonable and um, you can, you know, that they ask people who fork it to to also send them some back some transaction fees. I think there's a lot of goodwill in the ocean community um, that uh, a lot of people do end up keeping the fees back to. So, you know, there's a data, there's another marketplace called the data union marketplace. They charge transaction fees, but they also send some fees back to ocean as well. So um, that's one of my favorite things about ocean is the, the community of projects that are building together. And there's a lot of goodwill and a positive sum interaction. Um, and so I think to date, they've been really reasonable. Of course, there's some amount that would be too high. Um, I think anything around like five to 10% would probably be too high. Ryan. Um, yeah, so the way I look at it, it's like, if you have like technical debt, this is almost like a, a form of like liability debt where the more the, the marketplace as a whole gets valuable, then over time, then it's like, you know, the more incentive for someone to come and fork or, or, or not. Um, one interesting thing for me that uh, I can link to is this notion of a hyperstructure, which is invented by um, founder of Zora, Jacob, and that his thesis is if you create like a base layer marketplace with no fee um, and the value of the marketplace is built upon others that come and build on top of your your uh, your hyperstructure, your marketplace, and that over time provides more value to the base layer hyperstructure and disincentivizes others from, from, from forking you over time. I think that's really interesting to, to look into maybe in another call, I'll, I'll link to that. Um, and then one interesting notion about that is this idea of, um, I think he calls it uh, the, the threat of the switch, meaning within the smart contract, you have the ability for people to easily vote and turn on a fee, but by having that um, chance of the fee, like completely and in, 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 in a one vote type environment can change the incentive of the whole entire hyperstructure. So just having the threat of the fee is like kind of what the underpinning of the whole entire mechanic, not to oversimplify it, but I'll link to that if, if anybody's interested. But again, the whole thing with that is that it's fee list. There's no fees outside of, of uh, you know, gas and that type of thing. So very interesting for people that are looking to build their own marketplace. It's like, at what point are you building like a layer one versus building on top of something else? And if you decide to build on something like an ocean, you also have to think about like what I was just saying, like this liability debt of like, yes, this, what happens if this thing gets uh, forked because there's a 5% fee in it right now. And, and, and yeah. I'll put, I'll put a link to the hyperstructure thing in the chat. The funny thing is that Ocean wants as many people to fork it as possible. They make it as simple as possible to fork everything, including the, the web app itself. And so there's a huge amount of projects out there using Ocean. And, you know, probably some of those, they're not going to get some of the value from the technology that they created. So it's almost like they're putting this thing out into the world because um, they believe it's good and they're not going to get all of the value back, but some projects will. Um, keep those transaction fees in for Ocean. So, I mean, it underpins everything from, you know, I think they were close with Vita DAO in the early days. Um, huge amounts of data projects uh, uh, are, are built on or uh, use some derivative of Ocean protocol. So I really think it is going to underpin a lot of the, the data economy, even if Ocean doesn't accrue a lot of the rewards from that. Interesting. Thank you, Richard, Ryan. I'm mindful of time. Lots of wonderful contributions in the chat as well. Um, thank you, truly. Changed the direction of things. Um, I don't know that we'll have time to do the voting at the end here, which is something I think we're, um, is an aspiration of ours so that we have the full two weeks to kind of prepare. I'll note that Ethereum and Curve were the second and third place in the voting last time. Um, and perhaps we'll put it to a vote sooner than later in the token communities chat so that we can prepare our next guests, whichever direction we decide to go. 
and keep the fluidity of conversations going. Um, we'll gladly take any feedback on the session itself. Um, Michael, any last words that you might have? No, it's great. Uh, looking forward to the next one. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Um, thank you, Richard, Ryan, um, and everyone for joining. See you guys.